this object on the heap. What happens to the object that's in location 101? Originally it was pointed to by X, but now we've pointed X to the same object that Y is pointing to. So what happens to the object in location 101? It goes away, right? It's garbage collected, all right? Let's think this through, all right? Again, assuming this is the only code that's relevant here, we have nothing that points to this memory location anymore after we execute these statements. Because both X and Y point to the object that's in 201. So nothing is pointing to 101. So, there's really nothing we can do with it. All right? It doesn't do us any good. Even if we wanted to do something with it, we don't have any object reference to it. We don't have any pointer to it. All right? Therefore, we can't possibly write code to access this. And Java is aware of that. And what Java will do is Java periodically runs what's called garbage collection. Now, she used the phrase, eventually it will go away. What it means is, is that the garbage collection facility of Java runs constantly and looks for any objects out there on the heap that nothing is pointing to. And if there's an object on the heap that nothing is pointing to, it frees up that space. The reason it does that is that that is of no use to you. All right, that is of no use to you because you can't possibly access it. So that memory location is dead to you. So it might as well just go away. Might as well be freed up for, for other stuff. Now she used the word eventually again. It won't necessarily happen instantaneously. There could be some sort of timing where that, that is there for a little while. Um, But it really doesn't matter from your perspective. Once you've gotten rid of the last reference to that object, it's gone. Either it will literally be gone when it's garbage collected, or um, effectively it will be gone because you can't access it at all. All right? So the lifestyle of, a, of an object. What creates an object? Well, the constructor. And specifically, how do we invoke a constructor? We do it with the new keyword. So new creates an object. When does an object die? When is the memory freed up for it? The memory is freed up for it when nothing points to it anymore. All right? So in this case, you know, in general, if your question is, how many objects do I have? You count the news. Right? Let's consider another scenario. Slightly different scenario. If I say circle x equals new circle, that creates our memory location called x, creates an object out on the heap, we'll say in location 101 again, and sets the pointer for x to point to that object that was created. If I now say circle y equals x, all right, do I create a new object on the heap? No. The object on the heap is created when I execute the new command. So if I were to ask you how many objects I have, if I have a string of statements like that, you'd count the number of news. Because each new creates an object, puts it on the heap, and then points to it. All this is doing is this is creating the reference 
not the object. So if I say circle Y equals X, it will create an object reference called Y, and it will set the value of it to the same value as X, to the same pointer as X, so it will point to the same object. So in a nutshell, this creates the object reference variable. The new creates the object itself. All right? So again, if I had a string of these, you know, a whole bunch of them, and there were some news and some not news, if I asked you how many objects you'd have, you'd count the number of news statements, and that's how many objects would get created. All right? Again. When does it go away? It goes away when nothing points to it. All right? So let's run a scenario. doesn't 
point to a circle anymore. Y doesn't point to anything anymore. Therefore, boom, blows up. This is one of, you know, David Letterman did a top 10 list for the top 10 Java errors that you'll encounter. Uh, no object pointer would probably be somewhere on the top 10. It would probably be somewhere in the upper reaches of 10. Now, the interesting thing is, is the compiler is smart. All right? If I were to do something like this, Z set radius, The compiler looks and says, hey, they declared a Z, but didn't initialize it, and now they're trying to set the radius. The compiler will give you an error and say, hey, Z isn't going to be defined at this point, so it's not going to work. So some of the null object references, you'll get a compile time. If it's straightforward enough that the compiler knows for sure that, hey, that might not have a value. If, however, you go through some gyrations and create some objects and destroy some objects and all that, the compiler sort of can't follow it. And therefore, you'll get this error at runtime. When you run it, it will detect that there's no object there. So that's something to be aware of. Uh, we'll talk about how to handle this sort of thing, but that's a very common error that you can get. And again, you'll either get it at compile time or runtime. Obviously, at compile time is the good time to get it, right? Because you can fix it then. Runtime, there's things that you can do to make sure. For example, you could test before you do anything with an object. If there's any doubt whether that object's been initialized or not, you can check to see if that object's null. All right? Or you could write exception handling code to, it, to handle it if it is null. So, let's summarize what we know about object references and objects. Well, forget about primitives for now. They're, they're primitive. They're straightforward. We got those down. Object references are variables that point to objects. Object references are, uh, object reference variables are created when we have a statement that looks like this. Class name, space, object name. We're creating an instance of the circle class and we're calling it X. The object itself is created when we issue the new command. Circle x equals new circle. That says, hey, create a circle object out on the heap, the heap being the place in memory where objects live, and then we store whatever memory location that is in the object reference pointer of x. So the new creates an object, and it stores a pointer of it in whatever variable we have here. Whenever a object is involved in either a function call or a function return or an assignment statement, it's done by reference. You are not copying the actual object on the heap. You are copying the pointer. You're copying the object reference. So therefore, this statement here doesn't create a new object on the heap, all right? Because objects are only created when you have a new. This statement here will copy the pointer that's in, oh, this, I'm looking at this statement. The statement here copies a pointer that's in the x into the object reference of y. This kind of syntax declares my object reference variable but doesn't set any value to it. So it is a null object pointer. If I try to do something with that object, I'll get an error. Depending on exactly where I try to do it and so on and so forth, I could get that error at runtime or I could get that error at compile time. A statement like this, again, assigns the pointer that's stored in Z to Y. So in this case, it would null out that object. 
Therefore, if I executed this, I would get an error because y no longer points to a valid object. However, in this scenario, the object that's stored in location 101 is still alive. Why? Because something is still pointing to it. All right? And as long as something is pointing to it, it's still alive. So if I were to say z equals x, that would copy the value in x into z. If I would say x equals y, it would copy the value of y into x. And that object is still alive, right? Because someone still points to it. If, however, in my last statement I said z equals x, at that point, <coughs> no one would be pointing to it, and this object would get garbage collected. So it's inaccessible to us, and at some point, Java is going to reclaim that memory. Now, how well and how efficient Java is at reclaiming that memory you know, has a big uh, impact on what the performance of Java is. It's my understanding that earlier versions of Java didn't really have great garbage collection, so stuff hung around more than it needed to. You know? But as they've improved the quality of the garbage collection, that makes it more efficient, that will keep it leaner and lower memory. Questions about any of this? All right, on to constructors. Constructors. Constructors are invoked when you issue the new command. Constructors are created in your class one of two ways. One way is you can do nothing and let the compiler handle the constructors. All right? It's kind of like a lawyer, right? If you don't have a lawyer, one will be provided for you. All right? If you do not have a constructor as a Java class, one will be provided for you. So if you do not declare a constructor, any constructor, and we'll talk about multiple constructors, constructors in a minute here, but if you don't declare any constructors, the Java compiler creates a constructor that contains no arguments for you and simply creates your object on the heap just, you know, just with default values, with no, with no values, an empty object, if you will. Okay, well, if the compiler creates a constructor for you, why would I ever want to create a constructor? You know, gee, I, I like letting other people do my work for me. Why would I bother to go in and create a constructor? I do that because I may want to initialize my objects in a certain way. Or put differently, I might want to provide a mechanism where people that use my objects can initialize them in several different ways. All right. Because keep in mind, when you're creating, when you're defining an object, you're defining a component. That, that other people are going to use and integrate into their programs. For example, with the circle. If I had no constructor in the circle class, when I created a new circle, it would simply create that circle object and not do any initialization. 
But I might want to instead provide a constructor so that people can create the circle and initialize a radius all at one time. All right. I was assuming before in my circle class that I had an integer for radius. And I said I had a, I'll write some functions out, a set radius function that accepted an argument and set the radius to the value of the argument. I also assumed I had a get radius function. Which returned the value of the radius. I might also have
much on my own, the compiler looks and says, hey, they got this handle. I don't, they, they don't need my provided constructor. They're handling the constructors. So, if I create any constructor, if I create any constructor on a class, then the no argument constructor that the compiler provides won't be there. And I will get an error. So with the compiler, it's all or nothing. All right? Either it will generate the one no argument constructor that simply creates the object, doesn't do any initialization, or if you want to get into the business of creating your own constructors, you lose the generated constructor. So what if I wanted a no argument constructor that worked like the other one did? I would have to go and create one explicitly. So I could create a constructor with no arguments that maybe didn't do anything or maybe initialize the radius to one or, or whatever I thought the default value, a good default value for a circle would be. Now, we can have multiple constructors each having its own set of arguments. This is also true for methods. Actually, we can have methods of the same name with different arguments. That's called overloading a constructor or overloading a method. All right? Let's say if these were, let's pretend these were circles that we were drawing on our Android app. Okay? There might actually be two attributes then. There might be a radius. All right, let's have actually, let's say that there's four attributes. There's a radius, there's a color, we'll say it's a string. There could be an integer for the x position of it and an integer for the y position of that circle. So let's say we're putting a circle somewhere on the screen. And there's four properties for it. There's the radius of it, there is the color of it, there is the x position and the y position. I could have a method, or a constructor rather, that accepted an integer argument. So I could define all these constructors. And I won't write out the exact code, but I'll describe what they do. I could create a circle constructor that accepted an integer argument. And that would set the radius and maybe default the other properties. I could have another constructor, and you could do similar things with methods, the, the business of overloading. I could have another constructor that accepted the radius and the color, and set the radius and the color to those arguments and default the position. I could then have a third constructor that maybe accepted all four of the arguments and set those. As, as being the creator of this class, I get to decide how people are going to work with it. So I get to decide how many constructors there are. Maybe I make it such that the only constructor that I will define is a constructor with four arguments. In other words, if you want to create a circle, you better tell me how big you want.